Good morning and welcome to our service online. And here we are today picking up from Hebrews chapter 11, the second half of that chapter. So you can either turn in your Bible or read along here from chapter 11, verses 23 to 40. And we're going to finish up this chapter today. But we continue on with the great a list of Old Testament saints and their faith. So let's uh, hear from God's word. By faith, Moses was hidden by his parents for three months after his birth because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called a son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to share ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered abuse suffered for the Christ to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, unafraid of the king's anger, for he persevered as though he saw him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith the people passed through the Red Sea, as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets who, through faith, conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Our Lord and God, we thank you for your word, for the reminders of those who have gone before us, the people who have been blessed by faith and through faith. And we ask that you would strengthen our faith today. We pray that we would hear your words of encouragement and derive our strength from them. And now, God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> when is the coronavirus going to be over? That is a question I've heard, mostly from kids. But it's not one we can easily answer. And really, to be honest, until this week, we couldn't even answer the question of when they'd be going back to school. When is the coronavirus going to be over? How long will it be? We are people of faith, people of hope. As we remember from early in Hebrews here, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Now, I may have uh, shared, shared this story before, but when we were in Florida a couple years ago, we ate out at an Italian-American restaurant chain that my wife really loves, and the kids had their meals, which came with a complimentary dessert. So when they were done eating their dinner, we told them that they could have a dessert, but it had to be one of the two options included on the menu with the meal, and an ice cream sundae or I believe the other was Jello, And I suppose I didn't phrase the question very well, but I asked my older son, what do you want for dessert? Do you want ice cream sundae? And he immediately responded, no, 
I want ice cream now. There was no way a three-year-old is going to wait until Sunday to get his ice cream. That's a long time to wait. And as Christians, as people of faith in God's promise, as people of hope, we have this thing called waiting. But we might still ask, why do we have to wait? Why are we looking forward to these unseen things? Why do we have to wait, especially when things aren't going so well? We might echo the question of Psalm 13, how long, O Lord? How long, O Lord? We may not be able to find the answer to the question of how long something will last, but God does share with us at least one reason why we're waiting. And we find that here in Hebrews 11. But to get there, at the very end, we're going to continue our way through the Hall of Fame of Old Testament saints. Now, these are the people in the Old Testament who, as we know, lived by faith. They did great things by faith. The first part of the group is made up of those patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and, and Jacob's son, Joseph, and even grandchildren are mentioned there. But now we're picking things up, beginning with the, one of the biggest names of all in the Old Testament, Moses. And as you know, if, uh, if you've been around here for a while, you know, if you want to learn more about Moses, look at the Life of Moses series on, online there in our YouTube videos. But Moses is uh, very big. He's very important. And we have a highlight list of his life here in Hebrews 11. It says, by faith, Moses was hidden by his parents for three months. And after his birth, this was after his birth, because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Now, some wonder what's that word beautiful in the Hebrew. It's just the word tov, which means good. It's about as general as you can be. But... Uh, there aren't a lot of virtuous qualities of a child, you know, at a certain age. But somehow the parents looked at Moses and knew there was something special, something good about him. And they decided to keep him alive, even though the king's edict said that the, the sons, these, these sons who were born to the Israelites should be tossed into the river. So what they did is they defied the king's edict. They kept him alive. And that takes a lot of faith when you think about it. It's not, uh, it's not an easy thing to go against what the government has said if they're telling you to do something that's actually wrong. And in this case, the, the king's edict was totally wrong. It was the wrong thing. But to save their baby's life, they were willing to take that risk of, of facing the, the king's wrath and opposition. That was something they did. And this is not even Moses' faith, but this is the faith of his parents. And you could imagine that perhaps, as we know the story of Moses as it goes, they, they put him in the basket into the river. So they kind of followed the rule in a way, but they protected him at the same time. But his mother became his, his nurse for those early years of life. And who knows, maybe she even was able to raise him a little bit in, in the faith of the, his people. Of course, we find out that by faith, Moses started to do things when he grew up. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called a son of Pharaoh's daughter. Even though he was adopted into an Egyptian home, he chose rather to share ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. So he must have known that he was Hebrew, he had that connection. And if, if it's by faith that he made a choice, then he must have been acquainted somewhat with what that faith was, who this God was. If you remember when he finally encounters God in the burning bush and, God, and he asks, who are you? And he says, I'm the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. Moses doesn't say, well, who's that? No, he has some knowledge of, of these, these ancestors. He knows the, the first fathers of his people, and he probably already knew a lot of those stories that we have in Genesis. He knew about them. He knew of these promises. And so Moses had faith, and he, he by faith, chose to say goodbye to all the comforts and luxuries and the easy Egyptian life, instead to, to go into the Hebrew life 
and face the challenges they face. And it's not that everything in life that you enjoy is sinful, but when we put that in the wrong place or we, we put our emphasis and put our life all into the things of this world, that it, it becomes sinful. And he chose, instead of Egyptian comfort, he chose Hebrew hardship. And he considered abuse suffered for the Christ to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to the reward. Now this is rather striking. When we think of Moses, we don't usually think that he had, say, a Christian faith. We wouldn't think, oh, wow, he had this uh, fully developed faith. But here, it says that he does. And, and if you think about how much uh, faith and, and how much is revealed, even in the book of Genesis, about a promised uh, one who would come, you know, the one who would crush the serpent's head, for example, or even in Abraham, there would be, uh, the Lord has yet to provide a lamb. There are all these elements that could be a, a basis of Christian faith. And so for the sake of that promise of a greater reward, as we know, they already believed in life after death. Enoch, where did he go? They, they knew there was something to look forward to. And, and Moses had that faith. And so that's why he said goodbye to Egypt. He said hello to God's people. It is an interesting thing. But of course, we see here a glimpse of the cost of faith. But it's worth it to follow God in his way when you're looking ahead to a better reward than anything this world has to offer. You can say goodbye to the, the, the pleasures and delights of today for the greater good of tomorrow. He had this knowledge, and this is the knowledge we have, that the Christ would come. He would suffer and die for the forgiveness of our sins, but by faith, we would have those sins forgiven. We would have the hope of eternal life in him. And, and God's people, although they experience different things throughout history, the basic faith is the same. And God worked through that faith through the generations. You know, but faith is not only how we hold on to the hope in God's promises, it's how we receive the benefits of those promises when God finally fulfills them. And so we don't want to forget how important faith is. And he knew that if he kept his faith, he'd get there. But what else did Moses do? Well, by faith, it says he left Egypt, unafraid of the king's anger, for he persevered as though he saw him who is invisible. Now, this of all of the, the parts of Moses' life that's recounted here in Hebrews, this is probably the most sort of challenging in a way. Because if I were to ask you, do you remember Moses leaving Egypt? Do you remember the king being angry? And do you remember a reference to fear? You'd probably say, oh, I can see a connection, a few connections there if I go all the way to Exodus chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. And it says this. Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely this thing is known. And this was, of course, him killing the Egyptian, right? Standing up for a fellow Israelite, killing an Egyptian. And then he intervenes with two Israelites fighting. And they say, who do you think you are? Are you going to kill us like an Egy that Egyptian? He's like, uh-oh. So what happens? Well, Moses was afraid. And he thought, surely the thing is known. And then when Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian. So here we have Moses leaving Egypt. We have the mention of the king really being a source of danger. And we have a mention of fear or being afraid. However, they don't match up very well, do they? <laughs> what happens in the first in Hebrews is saying Moses is leaving Egypt unafraid of the king's anger. But here in Exodus 2, it sounds like Moses is afraid and he's leaving out of fear of the king's anger. And there are, of course, different uh, solutions that people have proposed for this. Now, the first thing to note uh, uh, is that there are two times Moses left Egypt. There are two main times Moses left Egypt. The first is this one in Exodus 2. And the second main time is when? Well, after he's gone back to Egypt and he's bringing the Israelites out with him, 
right? So that's what we call the exodus, the, the departure and leaving Egypt the second time. And so some uh, will look at this and say, well, okay, is this compatible with uh, Exodus 2? Is there an actual contradiction? And some people, and I think it's fair to say, that you can reconcile these two passages because although it says Moses was afraid, well, maybe that was Moses' initial fear. Like his feeling when he found, okay, somebody found out about me killing this Egyptian and now that's not something I expected people to know because I hid the body and I did this and I thought nobody knows about it. So he's hit with fear at first. But then that fear disappears and he, as we know, was already a believer. By faith, he abandoned the Egyptian life. So he's a man of faith. And so in his faith, he's not afraid anymore, but he doesn't really want to get killed by the king. So he still leaves. <laughs> okay, so, so there's, you could reconcile that you could say Moses was afraid and then he didn't, but that was a temporary thing. And then Moses heard of it and he sought to kill Moses, but Moses flees or leaves because he doesn't want to die, but he still does so in faith. Now, that's, that's technically not a contradiction there. It's technically compatible, but it's a little, like if I were to say, hey, um, do you remember that time Moses, uh, in faith left the king and left Egypt and he wasn't afraid of the king's anger. Well, you probably wouldn't be able to extract that idea from Exodus 2. You, you, even if you could reconcile them, you're probably not going to draw it out from that. On the other hand, we have the possibility of uh, Hebrews 11:27 referring more to Moses leaving Egypt with the Israelites, with the Exodus after he stands up to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And uh, he, Pharaoh finally sends them out and tells them to go. But Moses knows they're going to chase him. He knows Pharaoh's heart's hardened. He knows there is a danger, but Moses is going anyway. And he's going with all these unprotected people with their livestock and extra jewelry and gold and all of that. And not an army of them not really all armed and ready for battle, but just a big group of people. And he's doing that without fear. Now, so if you were to look at the highlight reel of Moses's life, not many of us would go to Exodus 2 and say, oh yeah, do you remember when he, by faith, you know, he was a believer and he, he ran away. Because there's not much faith motivating him. That's not a highlight there in Exodus 2. And so I really would favor the second view or the second departure when he's leaving Israel with the Israelites. There's a lot more faith that seems to be involved there. Even though you could reconcile the, this with Exodus 2, Exodus 2 is really not one of the highlights I'd put in Moses' life of how he showed faith and he left Egypt to, you know, get married and become a shepherd. Right? That's to, that didn't take as much faith as maybe taking the Israelites out. So I'd really go uh, lean more towards the second departure. But that aside, you know, this is a big thing. You know, so this is uh, Moses still a man of faith. You know, bringing the people out. That's a, a part of faith. Now, some people are a little hesitant and they prefer the first one because it's not in chronological order then because the Passover which is mentioned next, chronologically came before Moses leaving with the people of Israel. But that's, you know, only a, a slight difficulty, and we can shrug, kind of shrug our shoulders at that, all right? So that's why I still favor the second view, because that's real faith in action. So what else did he do? Well, by faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. Can you imagine... An angel of death is coming through. What are you going to do? Run, right? I'm out of there. <laughs> Let's just go. Uh, but that wasn't the way to do it. In, instead, what they had to do is just trust that this Passover lamb that they slaughter and they cook and they eat, but they apply the blood to the, the door frame of their front door, that that was going to do it. But the angel of death would pass over them if only they, they, they practiced that. Now Moses is highlighted here 
in keeping the Passover, probably also because he's the one who establishes the Passover as, as not just a one-time event, but it would be a memorial, a practice, a ritual they would repeat through time. But if you believe that it's going to be repeated year after year, at the same time every year, that takes faith, doesn't it? It means you believe not only it's going to work that one time, but you're really going to get to the other side of the Red Sea, right? You are really going to make it. You're going to live. And that's faith. And then so in verse 29, by faith the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land, but when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. So the Egyptians, like we might say here, notice, of course, that uh, the Israelites had faith to go across what should, where water should be, okay? If you, you imagine the movie, The Ten Commandments, and you're saying, okay, I'm going to walk beside, you know, if it looked like that, <laughs> you'd be like, I don't want to stand beside that. But the thing is, it took faith to say, we can get across, we can trust, we can make it. Now, didn't the Egyptians think they could get across too? Well, apparently they did, but their faith was of a different kind. The Israelites had faith that they would make it, that God would protect them. The Egyptians just were, were emboldened by their attempt to destroy the Israelites. So their faith was not in God. Their faith was in the wrong place. They might have believed that if the Israelites can do it, I can do it too. But their faith was not the same. It was not in the God who was there to rescue the Israelites. If they believed in God's plan, if they had the faith that God was going to save the Israelites, they wouldn't have followed. That's the faith they needed to have. And any of them who did have that faith were, in fact, joined with the Israelites. And they, there was a group of Egyptians who went with the Israelites along the way. But here we have Moses leaving Egypt again, like the second time, but of course in faith, in a powerful way. What else can we say? Well, that was Moses. He's very uh, exciting and good. Who, who took over after Moses? Well, Joshua. We keep moving. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. And by faith, Rahab the prostitute who lived there did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. So if you think, okay, we've got a battle plan here. What are we going to do? Okay, we're going to attack the city. Okay, how are we going to attack them? We're going to walk around it seven times. Uh, all right, and then what will we do? Well, we'll blow trumpets. <laughs> okay, that's not a real military strategy, but it is a strategy of faith. And we don't know how God does what he does. We don't know. Uh, we could try to hypothesize as to, you know, what made a wall fall down. Was it already pretty flimsy, ready to go? Or did some, God do something else? We don't know. But we do know that God did it for his people. And, it, and he did it because they believed. It wasn't because of their strength or the vibrations of a trumpet or something like that. Not very likely anyway. But God did it for his people. And here we have Rahab, who's a really interesting person in the Bible. But what, what needs, what's so neat about her is that she stands out as someone who's, she's not an Israelite. She's just heard about this group of Israelites who are really successful, who have this God with them, who are something to be feared. And, and, but, but her view wasn't, okay, let's see if we can fight these people. She instead had the approach, well, maybe their God is real. Maybe I should take their God seriously. And so when the spies come to her, she welcomes them in. And she actually defects from the Jericho population and joins in with the Israel population. And what's interesting and is amazing is that God was ready and wel to welcome her. The people were ready to welcome her. And God, in fact, was ready to welcome her. Because I think God was the one who was working in her heart. Even though she was not a significant or important person, or even someone of a good reputation in Jericho, God can take someone like that and her family and say, look, by faith, I'm going to save you. I'm going to rescue you. And, and we forget that sometimes about the nation of Israel. Although they were not going into the world to evangelize and make disciples of all nations, they were ready to accept people in from other nations. It wasn't an all or nothing thing 
just like the Egyptians, people from, from uh, Jericho or wherever could join in to the people of God. And she was welcomed. And it's a great reminder to us that we can be welcomed into the God's people too, no matter what our background is in our personal history. And what else shall we say? Were these enough examples? You feel like we're going through the whole Old Testament here, aren't we? We have Moses, we've got Joshua and Judges. Like, yeah, now let's get into Judges, right? And what more should I say, says the author of Hebrews. The preacher who's like preaching a sermon, it's almost like, he's, hey, oh, I've got a timeline here. I better get this moving. He, he looks at his, his uh, sundial or whatever they, or <laughs> Uh, what would they use? An egg timer, a sin glass thing? I don't know how they measure time at that in this context. But he said, what more should I say? For time would fail me if I went in through all these guys. Who? Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, King David, Samuel, and the prophets. Now, do we know all these people? Most, some of them should be familiar. Gideon is the one who had this army of 32,000. And he gets it down to 300, less than 1%. He says, okay, now we're ready for battle. And hey, what's his battle strategy? Okay, we're going to break some pots and light some torches. And <laughs> same idea. It's not by their might, but it was by their faith in God. And God gave them the victory. Barak, who was he? Well, he was the, the associate and comrade uh, and partner with Deborah, who's maybe a more famous name. But they, were gained, milita they gained military victory against all odds as well. Samson, very familiar to us, right? He's very strong, didn't cut his hair. And when he did, it didn't go so well. Jephthah, we might not be as familiar with him, but he's the one, in, also in the book of Judges, and you can see some of the references here. But Jephthah was the one who said, okay, God, if you give me victory, I will sacrifice the first person or thing to come out of my front door, which was a very rash vow. But he also won military victories. And what about David? We all know about him. How about he won a lot of battles, you know, defeated Goliath and so on. What about Samuel? He's important. He was actually the last judge. And he helps transition into the period of the kings. And the prophets, who, of course, did um, a lot of mighty and important things too. Now, just as an aside here, if you want to get a sense of the Old Testament timeline, Hebrews 11 isn't a bad place to start. Because if you go through the whole thing, you'll say, oh, oh, there's the, you know, by faith, we know God created everything by his word. And then you've got Noah and Enoch. You have all these people come through and, and you'll get a, a, a sense that, okay, we've got creation, the patriarchs, the exodus, the judges, then the kings and prophets. So it gives you a good overview because I know sometimes we forget uh, what came when, you know, who's who, and where do people relate to each other? So, you know, give this a good little uh, uh, viewing if you want to get a quick summary. But one thing to notice about all these heroes is that they're not perfect people. You won't want to read Judges 13 to 16 about Samson and read that to the kids at Sunday school and tell them to be just like him, right? You won't say, oh yeah, he's a great example to follow. And in fact, you wouldn't want to do that for Jephthah or a lot of other people who, among these judges, really did have their flaws. They made some bad choices. They all did. And yet, as imperfect as they are, they're people who displayed faith. And they accomplished great things. And so, when we look at this passage, and we see what they did, they, they through faith, conquered kingdoms. Administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions. Who would that be? We think Daniel, maybe? Ah, right? Quenched raging fire, maybe Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign enemies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection, maybe through the prophets, Elijah or Elisha. All these great things these people of faith accomplished. And here, we see these great successes gained by faith. And yet all these great events that God performed for people who live by faith. But, but we notice something here is that the examples aren't quite done. They don't end on this high note. We hear there were also people of faith who were others. 
others who are not so successful in this life. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release, in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death, they were sawn in two, they were killed by the sword, they went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. So here we have this list of all these great victories won by faith. You know, oh, we're crossing the Red Sea, we're, the walls of Jericho are tumbling down. And then we come to this other list, also people of faith. But the second list is, is getting through persecution and hard times. Now, who likes the first list better? Yeah, isn't that a little more fun? Wouldn't you rather do something like that, like go find a bad place and circle around it a few times and see the walls fall down? Like, isn't that more exciting than just saying, oh, I've got some tough days ahead? But you know what? The first list and the second list, everything they did and accomplished, it's by faith. Both lists are by faith. You see, the faith that can toss a mountain into the sea and the faith that simply carries people through the hardest times of life, it's the same faith. We might enjoy that first list of faith a little more. It sounds it's more fun and exciting. But what are we more likely to need in our lives? We're more likely to, to need the faith that holds up our hope for eternal life, that helps us get through those tough times. And we all need that. And we need that as Christians when we think of the great cost of discipleship. Following Jesus instead of the world comes at a cost. And that cost doesn't always look the same. But it's always some sort of social opposition. Maybe it's a subtle dislike, all the way to full-blown persecution and even death. And looking from the outside, people could look at a list like that. A list of all these others who suffered and say, well, that doesn't look that appealing. But think of it this way. All those people who suffered and died for their faith, they didn't regret it. They didn't say, okay, that's enough, I give up. They didn't regret it. Their faith and their hope was so good that the bad things they faced were nothing in comparison. And that, too, is the power of faith. It's the strength to take on anything the world can throw at you. Because by faith we know that God will keep his promise. That Jesus has forgiven our sins and we have eternal life to look forward to. And yet we could still ask that question. Even with faith, even filled with hope, we might still ask, How long, O Lord? How long? When do you want your dessert? Do you want ice cream Sunday or now? Do you want your reward someday or today? Well, we all want the good thing now. We don't want to face the hard times. We, it's good to know that we've got faith to carry us through, but it's true. We wish we knew how long. But at least if we don't know how long, we do know, at least in part, why we wait. That we're waiting for a reason. We're waiting for the same reason the Old Testament saints had to wait. What does it say? Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. So they did not receive what was promised, at least not yet. But what's the point? Well, that they wouldn't receive it apart from us. 
In other words, the goal here, the plan is for God, is that not just that we face some struggles and hardships and that we have to wait a while, but the point is that we're waiting for others, so we go through together. We go through it together. It's so much like that verse, 2 Peter 3, 9. You can share that for a second. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So God's not slow, but patient. And his patience is toward you, but not just the you who have already believed and repented, but all of you, all God's people who will ever eventually come to faith. God is patient towards us. And that patience can take a long time because it's not only for those who have uh, yet to come to faith, but also those uh, who maybe haven't even been born yet. As we look back on that list of Old Testament saints, there were generations going by and going by and going by. And even the people who first heard this message from Hebrews, they were waiting. And we're, even today, 2,000 years later, we are waiting. But we're waiting for a reason. We're waiting for others to join us. We're waiting for the full number to come in. All these, and this could maybe even be said of us, all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. They're going to be made perfect. The faith is going to accomplish the goal. The promise will be fulfilled. But we're going to share that together. And isn't that something that speaks to our situation today? There's so many things we don't get to share together. We're waiting for, so, for other people to join us. People who have gotten married during this whole ordeal, what is, well, some people say, well, maybe I'll wait or put it off for a few months. That didn't work for some people, did it? And so what did people do, though? Did they say, well, okay, let me do a video recording and just have people watch my wedding whenever they've got time? Well, no, I think most people, if they could, would actually try to, to record it and distribute it online live because the moment really did matter. Now, sometimes, you know, reading a book, it doesn't matter when you read a book. If you read a book somebody else read, it's, it's okay. Or if you watch a show somebody else watched. But a wedding is sort of special because you're going from not married to married. And it's like, okay, I want to see that moment. And so live stream that well, online for me. I want to see when that happens. The mo sharing that moment together matters. You think of a birthday party. It's like, it's not like, okay, here's your cake, blow the candles, so-and-so's here. Okay, whew, happy birthday. And okay, here's somebody else's here, now blow your candles again, do it for them. You don't do it five times, right? You, you want everybody together in the same room. Hey, everybody, come on, we're doing the, can we're doing the cake. Right, you'd share it together. You know, even at home, this is maybe not very special, but... Uh, you know, I watch, uh, you know, you can watch a full baseball game. You know, if you're watching the Blue Jays, you can, if you've got a few hours, you can watch a whole Jays game. Or the next morning, you can watch something called Jays in 30. But even if I'm watching most of the game at night and then I'm called to bed, hey, you're up too late, like, go to bed. Um, the next morning, I'll, I'll wait for my wife to watch Jays in 30 and I'll be there and I'll be like, oh, I want to share these moments. It's like, oh, do you think he's going to hit a home run? And she hates it because it's ruining all the suspense. And she says, don't stay in the same room with me. But I want to share the moment. You know, I want to share the moment. So I try to at least be subtle and not, you know, give too many hints of what's going to happen soon. But uh, the excitement and the events, we want to share moments together, don't we? Doesn't that matter? And that's what this is about. You know, we can't share everything together, but this big thing of being made perfect and having our faith completed, God has a plan that though we go through generations and we face a struggle, we're going to experience the joy of the Lord together, ultimately, at the same time. So what can we say? Well, don't give up. You know, keep doing those things that encourage your faith. Your faith is going to carry you through the tough things. So why not build up your faith? And what's one way to do that but to look at people like these, these lists of heroes who've shown their faith and lived out their faith. We read these Old Testament heroes and it's like, wow, that's a great way to do it. 
So why not open up your Bible and go through some of those Old Testament books? We've only touched on them briefly. But the neat thing is you're going to make it because of that faith that gives you that strong hope. You're going to make it through. We may not be able to find the answer to the question of how long it will be. How long will it last? But God does share with us at least one reason why we're waiting. It's so we can go through it together and enjoy the fulfillment of God's promise, those unseen, hoped-for things, receive them together. And that is to share the wonderful blessing of God, to whom be all glory forever. Amen. let us go with God's blessing. May the love of God our Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.